Welcome back, Defenders. Jake here. Ukraine blew up another submarine. Actually, not really. It was the same submarine. I'll explain how. Ukrainian armed forces sink a Russian submarine and destroyed four S-400 launchers in Crimea. So following the first attack, back in September of 2023, the $300 million Kilo-class submarine underwent repairs and was being tested in the waters of Sevastopol Harbor. And Ukraine decided to strike it again. This is the submarine, the Rostovan Don, and last September this was in dry dock, receiving repairs. When Ukraine successfully struck it numerous times with Storm Shadow cruise missiles. These are the only pictures we got of the damaged sub, and it's on fire, and there are numerous holes. I do believe in the video I said this is not going to buff out. Russia accepted the challenge, and they were trying to repair the submarine. I think they were just trying to repair the hull so they could get it into the water, and then tow it or sail it back to mainland Russia. They were trying to get this probably back to the port city of Novorossiysk. I don't think this submarine was going to be launching missiles anytime soon. So here are the uh, pictures of the port in Sevastopol where the submarine was being worked on. And Russia had to have spent countless man hours and millions of dollars trying to restore the hull of the submarine to salvage it. They did put up this netting above it to conceal it from satellites. But Ukraine had the intelligence on the ground. They had the information. The submarine was close to being repaired. And Russia was going, going to try to get it out of there. So they struck it again with another Storm Shadow cruise missile. This time it wasn't being supported, I guess, in dry dock. It was in the water. So now it sank. Now it's full of water on the bottom of this harbor. Here are the satellite images showing the construction and the, the netting. This is May 6th. Uh, the submarine was put inside here. This was July 29th, and then yesterday, August 2nd, you can see there's a hole in the netting because the submarine was hit. It's definitely underwater at this time. Additionally, Ukraine also damaged or destroyed four S-400 launchers uh, in occupied Crimea. This is just every day. Russia loses more of their air defense systems. And this means they can't protect Crimea. They can't protect the naval base in Sevastopol. Let's get to the bad news for Russia. Ukraine's army confirms strike on Russia's Morozovsk airfield. Aerial bomb warehouse was hit. The operation was conducted by the Security Service of Ukraine and Ukraine's military intelligence. And there's some pretty crazy videos online of this explosion. This was an ammunition depot and a fuel warehouse at the airbase that was targeted. And that's, that's a tree right there. From here to here is a tree. And this is how big the explosion is. The explosion was captured from multiple angles on cell phone videos. I'll link these down below, but it's a huge explosion. And this is where this airbase is located. Here's Luhansk. Here's uh, Rostov-on-Don. This is about I guess uh, 60 or 70 kilometers from the Ukrainian border. It was struck with uh, drones. And we do have uh, the day after satellite images. This is the day before. This is the day after. We can ignore the clouds, but you can see all these brown spots from where fields caught fire. And this corner up here, this is where the ammunition depot was and the fuel warehouse. That's the before and that's the after. There's nothing left. It's scorched earth. Oil Depot in Russia's Belgorod Oblast is the latest target in a Ukrainian drone campaign. This is almost every single night. An oil depot or an oil refinery somewhere in Russia goes boom. This was on the outskirts of the town of Glubaki. This is in the Rostov region. Here's Luhansk. Here's where this oil depot was. This is what it looks like on Google satellite images, and here's a picture of these oil depots on fire. Another oil depot was also hit, this in the uh, Kamensky district of the Rostov region. Uh, there are uh, uh, pictures and videos of the fire. 
According to UK intelligence, Russia's average casualties in Ukraine is dropping, but still exceeding 1,000 per day. Russia's casualty rates will likely continue to average around 1,000 a day throughout the remainder of August. So what are the numbers officially, according to foreign intelligence? The average daily Russian casualties killed and wounded has fallen over the past two months from 1262 per day in May to 1140 in July. The reason why it spiked in May and June was the Kharkiv Offensive. That was like four months ago, and it's been a complete failure. But this is still really high. Over 1,000 casualties a day. And this isn't helping. Russia to increase use of battlefield buggies and quad bikes and motorcycles. As Russia brings more tactical all-terrain vehicles to Ukraine, Kremlin's Ministry of Defense announced plans to establish all-terrain vehicle training courses. I can't see these pictures and videos of these buggies and motorcycles and not think about Mad Max Fury Road and... Russia's just a dystopian nightmare. I see these videos on Twitter every single day. I'll link this down below in the event you're not on Twitter or Telegram, but every day, Russians are taking motorcycles and ATVs into combat. It's one thing if you want a fast mode of transportation behind the lines to do supply runs or rotate troops, but they're taking ATVs and motorcycles into combat. They're charging the battlefield with them. So this is uh, to save money. Tanks and APCs are more expensive than cheap Chinese motorcycles and buggies. It's a cost-saving measure. So we've got a report on the ground from a Russian soldier. Yes, this man looks like he's about 60 years old, but this is a Russian soldier. And here's what he's saying about the situation on the front lines. Hello, friends. This is Sergei. News from the front line, from the SMO zone. My friends from the regiment are telling me terrible things on WhatsApp right now. I'll tell you about some of them. A friend of mine from the 299th Regiment, 3rd Battalion, 9th Company, was discharged for health reasons. First of all, he has uh, shell shock. His head is shaking. Secondly, he has a disability group 3. He had a perforated stomach ulcer. He was operated on and was in the regiment, where he arrived back in February. But he did not receive any treatment there. His name is Alexander Zirinov. So, my friends, he didn't get any medication. He was in the hospital. Everyone calls the Kostroma Hospital a meat grinder. That is, people are needed at the front, and they are half dead, and they are sent there. And he's not the only one. A man who has ruptured tendons on his right arm, who can't perform any physical actions for health reasons, is being sent back to the SMO. He was deliberately I emphasize deliberately not sent to the military physician board. And you know how many are like that? This is what our leadership, our president, is doing. He doesn't care about the SMO warriors. They send them half dead, like Sashka Zirnov. He won't even get there because of his health condition. And there are a lot of such cases. My friends, here it is, the true face of the Supreme Commander-in-Chief with his false words about the rights of SMO participants. We had not, have not, and will not have any rights. Yeah, I would say this elderly Russian soldier is correct, but people are still signing contracts. Here's another video I'll quick share. These are Russian soldiers hiding in a concrete tunnel in the Zaporizhia region describing their living conditions on the front. We're holding our effing line as best we can. So the cameraman is showing this tunnel that these Russian soldiers are living in. This is effed up, man. They're hitting us with every effing thing they can. Effing birds, artillery, mortars, I'm in awe, F. 
He's in awe, too. I'm even more. It's effed up. I got holes in my ass. Everybody's wounded. Holy sh. It's good that we got minor wounds, but some are dead. Two. They're lying there first. They ain't with us no more. It's effed up. So these are Russian soldiers living in a tunnel, hiding from Ukrainian drones. Sleeping in a tunnel with corpses. That can't smell good. Uh, these Russian men aren't going to survive until winter, just being honest. Ukraine's Baba Yaga drones now appear capable of launching guided munitions. Yes, this is the next evolution in warfare. This is horrifying that we're going to have unmanned drones firing off or dropping glide bombs on enemy positions. If I'm being honest, guys, this war never should have happened. It never should have happened because we all now live in a more dangerous world. The next time a dictator invades his enemy, he's not going to do it with tanks and APCs from the 1970s. He's going to have the best most insane, deadly drones that he can buy and build at mass scale. I'm just thinking about what the Chinese uh, are, are, are planning for Taiwan. Now that they've seen all these adaptations and evolutions from the Russians and the Ukrainians, the next war won't be fought like this war, and this is terrifying. Man sets himself on fire outside Moscow Government Service Center, this is the second self, self-immolation in Russia in less than a week. The RBC Business News website, citing an unnamed source, reported that the 61-year-old man, uh, eyewitnesses heard him shout, never give up and never give in. He was also reportedly singing a song as he was placed into an ambulance. So he didn't die. And I'm guessing something to do with corruption. The last man who set himself on fire in Red Square was upset about his business being stolen from him, so if this man was 61, it probably had something to do with money. This is uh, the big political news from the last two days. What makes the largest U.S.-Russia prisoner swap since the Cold War unique? This was negotiations between the United States and Russia that had been going on for months, and this is good news that Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershkovitz was allowed to come home. He was unlawfully detained for the crime of journalism in Russia, and he was brought back along with two other U.S. citizens, uh, a U.S. green card holder, and then several Russian nationals, Russian dissidents, who Putin had imprisoned. But I want to share this clip first of Evan. What was his initial reaction getting off the plane, landing back in the United States, and he wasn't thinking about himself. He was thinking about all the people still locked up in these Russian prisons. It's, it's one thing I'd like to say. Uh, it, was, it was great to get on that bus today and see a lot of, you know, not just Americans or Germans, but Russian political prisoners. But uh, I just spent a month in prison in Yekaterinburg where there's a whole, you know, basically everybody I sat with is a political prisoner. And nobody, nobody, no, nobody knows them publicly. Uh, they have, you know, various political beliefs, so they're not all connected with uh, Navalny supporters, which I think, you know, everybody knows about them. And so, I, it, today was a really touching moment to see all of them. But I, it would be, you know, I, I think to see if we could potentially do something about them as well. And I'd like to uh, talk, you know, talk. To the next no, weeks and months. Anyway. There has to be tens of thousands of political prisoners inside Russia's prisons right now. People who said or did only a minor thing, holding up a blank piece of paper in Red Square to protest. And Evan's right. Tens of thousands of Russians are sitting in Russian prisons right now as political prisoners for the crime of wanting personal freedoms the crime of wanting to live in a democracy, the crime of not supporting the supreme commander, Vladimir Putin, czar of Russia for life. So this is the official exchange numbers, 16 Westerners and Russian dissidents for 
eight Russian spies, and then two children. Uh, I'll link this down below if you want to see who were the eight Russians. They're all spies and assassins, people who killed people and were given, uh, you know, decade-long sentences in Western prisons. Russia wanted their assets back. But the weirdest thing is these two children, exchange sleeper agents' kids, didn't know they were Russian. So this married couple were Russian spies in Slovenia, and they were deep undercover, and they had two children, and these two children didn't know they were Russian. That's how deep undercover this married couple in Slovenia were. So all four of them were returned. But that's really messed up, Russia. Forcing children to become... I, I, I mean, I, I guess the parents consented to it, but it's so fucking weird. I think I just swore. Sorry, guys. So Ukraine's actually not happy about this exchange. They're happy to see American journalists returned. But these Russian dissidents, the second they got off the plane in Germany, held a press conference, and they didn't want to talk about Ukraine. They didn't want to talk about Russian war crimes. They didn't want to talk about ending the war. And they actually were counterproductive, making pleas to Western countries to ease sanctions on Russia. So let me break down who the most important person is. Vladimir Karamurza. Uh, this guy is important because he's a, a journalist, an author, a filmmaker, and a protege of Boris Nemtsov. Boris Nemtsov was killed by Putin, I think, in February of 2015. So this guy has been important in the Russian opposition movement abroad. He did return to Russia in April of 2022 to just be instantly arrested. And let me just read for you what he said, because this has a lot of people in Ukraine upset. I will certainly continue to participate in Russian politics, to engage in political activity, and it may be easier for me to answer your question than for my colleagues because, for a very long time, my main focus in political work in Russia has been international. At one time, together with Boris Nemtsov, we actively participated in the promotion of the Sergei Menitsky laws in several democratic states. Bill Browder is the man who started the Magnitsky laws, basically to go after Russian oligarch money to punish them for human rights violations and being insanely corrupt. So we're going to skip ahead, and uh, this is what he has to say about sanctions that have been placed on Russia since the launch of this full-scale invasion. We have seen in recent years, especially after the outbreak of war, after Putin's invasion of Ukraine in February of 2022, a setback from this principle by many democracies. This is what Andre said. And we see, I will be absolutely frank, that very often the sanctions of Western democracies are no longer directed against the Putin regime or against particular criminals in the highest ranks of Putin's regime, but against the entire country, against all Russian citizens. And this, in my opinion, is extremely unfair and counterproductive, because it gives Putin's propaganda, as Andre and Ilya said, great material to show that we are encircled by en enemies, a besieged fortress, and so on. Well, screw this guy. Uh, this guy just spent two years in Russian prison, and the second he's released, the only criticism he has is of Western democracies placing sanctions on Russia. It's okay if you want to sanction Russian oligarchs, take their villas, take their yachts, but sanctioning the Russian economy is hurting, hurting ordinary Russians. Oh, boo-hoo. So yeah, I understand why people in Ukraine are upset by these statements. Uh, sanctions against the entire country are unfair and counterproductive. I ask Western countries to extend a hand to Russians if sanctions are eased. No. Here's some thoughts from Ilya Ponomarenko. He's a Ukrainian journalist. Excuse me, but about 500,000 ordinary Russians 
are right now fighting to exterminate Ukraine. About 120,000 ordinary Russians have already been killed. 25,000 ordinary Russians are still joining the Russian military every single month. It's a war to exterminate Ukraine, supported actively by regular Russians, poisoned by the Kremlin's Nazi propaganda, of hatred, and or those participating in the extermination of Ukraine just for money, which meets no resistance from those who opt towards omission. This is much deeper than just a dictator waging a war of aggression. I think these Russian dissidents uh, are trying to set themselves up for a political future after Putin. If Putin and his regime collapses, they want to be able to fly home and say to the Russian people, we always supported you, we always defended you. Those evil Western democracies, they, they cause the economic collapse of our great country. And if you vote for me, we can rebuild it together. So absolutely, this is political posturing, but it's just shameless. They're not going to talk about Ukraine. They're not going to defend Ukraine. They're not going to be critical of ordinary Russians who support the war in Ukraine. I mean, I hate dictatorships, but sometimes even democracy sucks, guys. Let's move on. Opinion. Putin wants to deal. What does renowned analyst Timothy Ash see as the main takeaways from this week's Russia West prisoner swap? And politically, this is very fascinating because Putin didn't have to do this. Donald Trump has been screaming publicly, when I'm elected in November, I will get Evan Gershkovitz home. So Putin only had to wait like three more months to embarrass the Biden government, embarrass Kamala Harris, and release these Americans after saying that Trump struck a good deal. So Putin did this, I guess, potentially to embarrass Trump, or he's not happy with Trump at the moment. These negotiations have been going on for months, but I don't think Putin thinks he can wait another 100 days for Trump. A 24 to 10 swap, and two of these 10 were children, in the West's favor is not a great return for Putin, having to surrender high-level Putin critics like Kara Mirza and Yazin must have been painful for Putin. It shows that Putin wants to deal now, which creates interesting momentum around a potential Ukraine deal before the U.S. elections. There are clearly channels of communication open between Russia and the West, and these could be similarly used to talk peace over Ukraine. Yes, absolutely. The reason why Viktor Orban is on his stupid world peace tour is because the Russians are desperate for a ceasefire. Every day, they lose more assets, they lose more oil refineries and oil depots, every day sanction, sanctions deplete the wealth fund of Russia, and they can't do this. Well, I mean, Putin th doesn't even think he's going to make it till the November election. This is good news, but it also is uncertainty. We don't know what's going to happen the next three months. I don't even think Putin knows what he's going to do the next three months. If he can get some kind of deal where he can spin it to his people that they won, but then secretly give the West, you know, security guarantees like Ukraine can join NATO as long as I can keep Crimea and the Donbass region. We don't know what's going to happen. But this prisoner swap was a big move a big move that the Russians were even willing to cooperate prior to the November election. Zelensky confirms the delivery of F-16s and congratulates troops on uh, Ukraine's Air Force Day. I'll link this video down below, but this is President Zelensky in Ukraine, standing in front of a parked F-16, recognizing soldiers, giving a pretty good speech. We're running low on time, guys, so I'll, I'll link this down below if you want to see it for yourself. Let's get to the good news for Ukraine. Ukraine launches their second Turkish-built corvette in Istanbul. The First Lady of Ukraine attended the uh, launch ceremony. And I think these ships are being built by Turkey, and they're going to remain in Istanbul until there's safety in the Black Sea, and these ships can return to Ukrainian territorial waters. But... 
It's pretty fascinating that they're already building new ships, getting ready for a post-war period. Women's Sabre Team wins first gold for Ukraine at the Paris Olympics. This is a pretty inspiring video. I'll link it down below. This is the Ukrainian women's uh, fencing or Sabre Team uh, winning gold and then getting to see their flag raised and hear their national anthem during the event. Final clip I want to share with you is that of a 95-year-old Ukrainian grandmother who can't walk, and she helps her daughter make trench candles for Ukrainian defenders all day, every day. Складати мазі. Я приношу їх з цеху, де я заливаю їх це технічний поверх. Але я не маю часу складати, то мама мені складає їх у ящик, поскільки мені треба. Ось так. Тут у мене 60 штук геть з підписами, щоб хлопці знали склад, що сюди входить. Мама їх складає. Піднесенька моя мама, яка дуже хоче допомогти. Наблизити перемогу. Ось поки я фуріла, скільки мама зробила свічечок знову. Подивіться, 95-й рік. 95 years old, and she spends her days reading from the Bible and making trench candles. That's all for this update video. Glory to Ukraine, glory to the heroes. If you found this video informative, give me a thumbs up. Best way to support the channel. Comments and questions, let me know down below. I love hearing from you guys. Till the next video, keep defending the truth, keep defending democracy.